Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. This has been created for those of us that love radical women who live perhaps by the rules, but also question and challenge the status quo. We want more from our lives, to enjoy our sexuality, to explore radical thought, and to celebrate women who have lived and continue to live unconventional lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Baer, sexologist, educator, activist, and definitely a radical woman. Thank you for joining me as I share stories of women challenging the status quo and living life to the fullest. Join me as we unapologetically march to the beat of a different drummer together. Well, welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. Tonight, I am so excited to introduce you to my brand new bestest friend, Charlie. Charlie is from Texas, and I had the pleasure of being on her podcast yesterday. So in returning the favor, Charlie's here with us today. And, you know, I'm doing a series of podcasts with new voices. And Charlie's voice is a new voice that really impressed me in especially her ability to talk about both religion and queerness. So today I'd like to introduce to you Charlie from Texas. Uh, Charlie, would you add to that introduction? What would you say about yourself? Yeah, I am Charlie. I am a podcaster and I love to bake. I'm in my 30s, sort of a late bloomer. So (laughs) that's all about me really. Nothing right. special. Well, what made you, what's the name of your podcast and what kind of um, preempted you wanting to do that? Yeah. So my podcast is called Don't Mind the Mess and you can find us anywhere you get your podcasts. And me and my good friend Vivian, we met at ministry school about nine years ago and just Over the years, as we've grown and changed as people, but remain close, you know, it was nice to have someone to have those hard conversations with the ones that people don't really talk about, especially in the church. And so we decided to have those conversations on air to sort of give people a platform to hear different voices and also join in and feel comfortable and have the space to have these messy, weird growth conversations themselves. Well, I, I really like your podcast and I see so far you both took a book called Pussy and looked at the chapters and talked about it. You know, when you said you want to talk about different topics, not talked about in the church, Why did you choose pussy first? Okay, so Vivian's husband actually got her the book for Christmas because she's not big on her femininity, never has been. And she was scared to do it by herself. She went, I need someone to read this with me. I'm like, I'm terrified, but sure, let's jump in, let's do it. And so... Each episode, we go chapter by chapter through a book. Our first season is on pussy, a reclamation. So we're talking a lot about femininity, genitalia, sexuality, sacredness. And so, yeah, it's an adventure. Wow. So I, why, why do you think the church, when you say the church, which church are you talking about? And why do you think the topic of femininity or genitalia is something that's taboo or not talked about in the church? Well, uh, so when I'm talking about the church, I am talking about typically Protestant Christianity. So I grew up in a, it's been so long, was the name of that one. 
Oh, doesn't even matter. Does Episcopalian nailed it. Okay. So <laughs> I grew up in an Episcopalian church, but it was spirit filled. And then, you know, I've been to a Baptist church, non non denominational. And that is the sort of basis that I got like growing up was the Protestant Christian perspective with the Holy Spirit mixed in because not every Protestant denomination recognizes the Holy Spirit at large. They recognize that the Holy Spirit is there, but sort of shies away from the miraculous. And what was your other question? Why is pussy taboo oh. in the Protestant church? The patriarchy? Is going to be my answer. <laughs> I think it, I've done a lot of thinking on this topic, and I think it stems all the way back from, you know, how we've interpreted Genesis. So in Genesis, it says, you know, God says, let us make man in our image, male and female. And so the church has always sort of like seen God as God the Father, referred to God as a he, so on and so forth. And I've sort of come to this place of, I think God is a they, them. I think it's more accurate to say God the parent, the son, the Holy Spirit, you know, because Jesus was a historical figure. We have evidence of that. But it's sort of the shunning of the feminine that I've seen throughout our interpretation of scripture and then also throughout the church. And all I can say is it's probably about power and control. We talked a little bit about that yesterday when we recorded over on my podcast. And I think you were right. Well, that's the first time somebody said I was right today. So that's, that's <laughs> very, very encouraging, Charlie. Glad um, I could help. <laughs> well, I talked about growing up Catholic and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the figure of Mary is such an important figure in the Catholic Church, but still subordinate to God, he, him, right? So Right. And also, she doesn't really have her own agency. Like, barely consent happened. <laughs> barely. For her to be immaculately, you know, pregnant, to have that virgin birth. And so I think it's just weird the way that we have decided that women are only valuable in their relationship to men and also only allowed to have this much power or this much place, you know? Right. So when we, when we look at um, the church and mm -hmm. you look at your podcast and the first book that you, you reviewed and talked about, you chose the book pussy because you felt like females um, are subordinate to males and there's, there's still patriarchy in the church, in yeah. most churches. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, some churches be shocked, are... you know, do you think people in your, uh, local church would be shocked that you talked about pussy? Oh, if I went to a local church, they would be shocked. <laughs> um, I have not found a church here in Texas that I feel like is ready <laughs> for me as a human or the message that God has put on my heart. And it's, it's a long story. Every church I've gone to, every church I've gone to, it's just... I, I haven't felt valued. And we talk about that on the podcast a little bit, because one of the things the book talks about is she was searching for the divine in all of these different houses of worship and temples, and she couldn't find it anywhere. And I think sadly, that's true. A lot of our places of worship have lost the object of worship and have become about rules and regulations and not relationship with the divine. Now, you and your co-host, Vivian, met in um, theological school? 
We met at a supernatural school of ministry. Okay. Yeah, which is a little outside the box for typical Christianity Christians as well. Mm -hmm. It just essentially means the school's philosophy was that, you know, when Jesus said in the Bible, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, he meant it. And so that those gifts that were available to the church back then are still available to the church today. And so it was about not only connecting with God and being solid theologically, but also acting on that theology and doing good in the world. Now, both of you went to ministry school to be ministers. Was that your intent when you went? Nope. No, oh, neither of us. Uh, I don't know that there was an intention for me, at least I can't speak for Vivian, other than growth. I am someone who really believes in personal growth. And I was at a point in my life where I was feeling stagnant. I'm like, ugh, this is gross. Hate this. Lord, what am I supposed to do next? And I felt like that was what they put on my heart. Okay. Now, when we first met, our discussion fairly quickly went to the process of coming out as queer. Yeah. So, you know, when you put together the topic of religion and queerness, um, one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show today is to have that conversation about the church's perspective or Christianity's perspective on queerness. Mm -hmm. And you yourself are just coming out. I am. I am just coming out. I am a, a little baby gay. <laughs> little baby gay. Okay. Yes. Well, how, how did you un come to understand your gayness? So I am the sort of person who... Once I have a thought or a question, I'm very curious and very, let's get to business. So throughout my childhood, I had like crushes on Poison Ivy and, you know, Angelina Jolie and stuff like that. But because of, you know, my upbringing, I was always trying to pray away the gay and be like, not today, Satan you're not going to make a lesbian out of me. And just a lot of shame, a lot of heartache, a lot of like self-harm and just terrible, terrible years. And as I've grown and become an adult, it's something that keeps coming back. These feelings, these, oh, what if I got to kiss her? Or, you know, what if I got to hold hands? And the idea of marrying a man was appealing on one hand because then I'd be quote unquote normal. And I wanted that really desperately. And then on the other hand, it was like, oh, but what if I'm trapped? And like, I, it felt claustrophobic, the idea of it. And so I was always at war with myself. And then about five months ago, I was just sitting, thinking, talking to Jesus. And I was like, I think I, I think I'm ready to date women. I was finally at a point in my life where I'm financially stable, emotionally stable, so on and so forth. And so I felt like it was finally safe for me to explore these desires that I'd had and sort of pushed away. And so I contacted Vivian. I'm like, I think I might be bisexual. I don't know. And I was crying. It was a whole thing. She was so supportive. She's like, just get with Jesus, talk about it, see what's what. And so I did. And I did a lot of thinking, a lot of looking at my internal like fantasy life. And, you know, what would it be like if I married a woman instead of a man? What would it be like if I was in a relationship with a woman instead of a man? And I found that that excited me. The idea of being with a woman was so much more exciting was I didn't feel claustrophobic at the idea of it. And I was 
I was talking to a friend one night in a hot tub and hopefully it's okay if I get a little graphic on this. <laughs> Please. Okay. This, this show is mostly about sex. They're okay. To, so. Awesome. So we were in a hot tub chit-chatting with one of my friends and I'm like, the idea of a woman sitting on my face and me giving her pleasure is very exciting and arousing to me. And she's like, that's the gayest shit I've ever heard. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. And I think I'm okay with that. And so very quickly, I was like, no, I don't think men are for me. The fact that I hate semen, do not like penises, like not a fan, never have been, should have been a red flag, but because of my religious upbringing was not a red flag. <laughs> and that's how I got here. Okay. Well, you know, when I, when I teach about queer identity and, and how we figure out who we are, um, they, they start with a first step called identity confusion. And identity confusion is just having ideas that just don't fit the schematic that we learned, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you know, you're you're thinking about what you're being taught by the church and being taught by your parents and you're being and your internal feelings and your internal images and fantasies don't match the question is what do you do during that time like are you you know that's why we call it confusion because you can try to bury it right or you can try it and um and there are consequences of both types of actions or inactions, right? Yeah. But to come to the next kind of stage where you have identity acceptance, like, you know what? This is who I think I am. And, um, and you have a first date coming up. <gasps> yes, I do. And I misspoke on my podcast. I met them on a dating app. And looking over the pictures, I was really excited. I did not see that their pronouns are actually they, them. So I want to make sure that I'm not misgendering them. Mm -hmm. But I am very excited. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so have you dated men? Yeah. Um, sort of. I have hooked up with a bunch of dudes. Okay. Hooked up means had sex with. Yes. Okay. Ish. Uh I know I'm, you know, I'm twice as old as you. So I'm trying <laughs> to make sure that I mean, we use the same term for the same thing. Yeah. Hand jobs, blow jobs. They've happened. The last time I tried to have sexual intercourse with a dude, my vagina was like, nope. And <laughs> that was that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you, you have met men, you've dated men, you've had sexual relations with men and it just didn't fit and no yeah it, and now you're thinking about your first date you haven't had it yet so yet. are you using the word bisexual or are you using the word gay now i am using the word gay and it's because the more i think back on my life the signs were there and i just i breezed right past them because i wasn't ready to accept them my brain is like, if, if I don't see it, it's not there and I can deal with the other crisis in front of me. And until recently, until the pandemic, really, I, I lived my life from crisis to crisis, just sort of like trying to catch up emotionally, trying to catch up financially. And like I said, I'm finally in a place of stability. And that's why I think God was like, you're ready to handle this now. And a lot of my time with men was one trying to be normal, this desperate need to want to fit in to what other people had assumed of me. And then also too, my self-esteem was really wrapped up in, in being able to get a man erect or, you know, being able to prove that I was normal or that men found me desirable, even if like, I hate blowjobs. I hate hand jobs. The idea of a dick inside me makes me want to die a little bit. I was like, nope, this is what we're doing because that's how you prove that you can do the things. Right. So how do you explain to somebody from the church 
that you're okay with being gay. Yeah, I've had this conversation a couple of times. Once it went really well, and once it did not. <laughs> so basically for me, I I know that I'm doing okay because the fruit is good. So there's this concept of like spiritual fruit. You'll know them by the fruit that they produce. If it's, you know, a good spirit, then it'll produce good fruit. If it's bad, it'll produce bad fruit, pain, suffering, so on and so forth. Ever since, you know, when I was trying to deny my sexuality, so on and so forth, I was producing bad fruit after bad fruit, self-harm, eating disorder, suicide attempts, like just a hot mess express. And when I started accepting who I was and, you know, who God made me to be, I felt more connected to God than I ever had. I felt stable. I felt joy and hope. And so I would consider those good fruit. I, I love that description. And I've never heard that before. I like, oh. I like, you know, being a gay person, I've been called fruity before, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I, what if someone started, because this has happened to me, and okay. I can't even tell you the verses that were quoted to me because growing up Catholic, I never had to memorize the Bible. It was always read to me. Right. So when somebody starts quoting parts of the Bible that a man shall not lay with a man, et cetera, what would your response be? So I think for me, my whole exploration, even before I thought like, hey, I might want to be with women was I wanted to know as a Christian, how to be a better ally, how to be a better friend to my friends who were homosexual. And so I got with Jesus and I went, okay, I trust that the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. So I am going to dig in, do some research, go after truth. And I'll just trust that that will lead me where you intend me to go. That was my heart going into it. And so I found some articles about how I'm pretty sure that scripture that you were just talking about is in Lamentations question mark. It's usually brought up around Sodom and Gomorrah and all that jazz. And what I found was an article that talked about a researcher who had found that the earliest translations of the Bible and the earliest translations in German and Norwegian and all these other languages, the word that they use for, you know, man shall not lie with man, like the, the phrasing of that was originally, when you translate it, man shall not lie with boys as they do men. And so essentially it was condoning pedophilia. And for me, that makes more sense. That seems logical that a God who loves children, who, you know, loves creation, wouldn't want people being abused versus two consenting adults. The I believe from that article, and don't quote me on this, I believe that the German translation that had that in it was the last surviving one. And sometime in the 80s or 90s, the people who made the NIV translation for America paid to have the German translation done, and it was removed, and now it says, man shall not lie with man. So I don't know if there's a conspiracy theory happening. I don't know what it is. All I know is for me, it makes more sense that God would be concerned with pedophilia than with two consenting adults. That was a very intellectual analysis, Charlie. Um, I'm, I'm much simpler than that. I, I go through that whole list of things that were in, I, I don't know, the Old Testament that says you shouldn't eat shellfish and you shouldn't do this on that day. And all of those rules have been now forgotten and let right. go. Because of the so, new covenant. 
Right. So you just, I, my opinion is that you just can't pick and choose what parts of the Bible that you're going to listen to. But right. your point is, is well taken that, you know, the Bible is translated many times over and it wasn't written immediately. So it was interpreted from the very beginning. And, um, you know, a literal, a literal taking of what is in the Bible word for word is naive because word for word, it wasn't what was said a long, long time ago. How would we know? Right. And as far as like your point that you just made, yeah, we don't burn witches at the stake. Like thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. We don't go around burning people or at least not in modern Christianity. Like we don't stone people to death. Like there are a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament that we don't do anymore. The unfortunate thing is, is that is not an argument that is going to be reasonable to a lot of modern day Christians. Right. And I have hope. And Me too. I have hope that, you know, as we, as a society talk more and more about issues like this, and I, that's why I think it's so important today to talk about queerness and religion, um, folks will become more and more enlightened and understand as it's discussed and rather than just preached at us. Yeah. So as we conclude our show because we're already at the end, Charlie. Oh, wow. That was like so fast. I know. I know. Um, I, can you, what is your hope for the future? I mean, your personal hope uh, for your personal life, but um, uh, your hope for just queerness in society and the church and the relationship into the future. So for my personal hope, I want to get married. I want to have children. I always have. And I, I want to continue to do the things that excite me to write and podcast and get to experience those things with someone who will champion me and I get to champion them in their dreams in return. So beautiful, beautiful. And your hope for the Christian church? My hope for the church is that we will let go of all these rules and regulations and concerns and follow the spirit of truth that more people will get with Holy Spirit, get with Jesus, will love their neighbor versus pulling out scriptures like weapons and injuring one another, that the divide will be lessened. Powerful words. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So my hope is that your podcast, Don't Mind the Mess, takes off and my listeners will listen to your podcast and hopefully your listeners will listen to my podcast because I think we kind of go together like chocolate and peanut butter. And, uh, <laughs> That's a yummy one. Yes. Yeah. We complement each other very, very well. So Agreed. for today, Charlie, because our, our show time is over, mm -hmm. um, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak on my program, The Radical Rhythm. And I feature women who march to the beat of their own drum. And you do, my friend. And <laughs> that is a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Radical Rhythm podcast today. It has truly been my pleasure to invite guests and talk to you about my passion, the joy in our sexuality, and radical women who march to the beat of a different drum. If you'd like to work with me, Dr. Tony Bear, I have a community where I give seminars every month. I also have a coaching program, both group and individual, and also a course, a self-directed course, because it's all about experiencing the joy life has to offer. 
I'd love to work with you. Check out my link below, www.tonybeared.com. See you next week, and don't let anyone dim your shine.